This week on the CNET Tech Review, the Motorola Droid gets a bionic makeover. Honda raises the bar with a 44 mile per gallon Civic Hybrid. Toshiba is back in the desktop PC business. And we're not making this up, another iPhone prototype goes missing. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. Apparently good things come to those who wait because Nicole Lee and the mobile team have been dying to get their hands on the Droid Bionic from Motorola. Now you may be tempted to run out, in slow motion of course, and pick up the Droid Bionic too, but be warned, it's gonna cost you. I'm Nicole Lee, Senior Associate Editor for CNET.com, and this is a first look at the Editor's Choice winner, Motorola Droid Bionic. It's been nine long months, and we finally have it in our hands. You may remember the Droid Bionic from our CES 2011 coverage. However, this Droid Bionic is a little bit different than the one that we showed. In fact, it's a little bit sleeker, a little bit sexier, and definitely a lot thinner. In fact, Verizon says that the Motorola Droid Bionic is its thinnest LTE phone. It's also the very first dual-core phone to support 4G LTE on Verizon. It ships with Android 2.3.4, which is the latest update for Gingerbread at this time, and it is free of the usual Moto Blur interface. It has up to five customizable home screens, and the menu is a little bit different as well. The 4.3-inch display on the Droid Bionic makes this phone a little bit big, but the screen is amazing. The QHD display really pops with color. On the back here is an 8-megapixel camera lens with an LED flash. It's also the first 4G LTE phone to shoot full 1080p HD video. Since the Droid Bionic has both a 1 GHz dual core processor and 4G LTE speeds, the overall phone experience is very fast. Navigating through the phone is very zippy, multitasking was not a problem at all. The browser was also quite impressive. It supports HTML5 content as well as Adobe Flash Video. In fact, we were able to load a Flash Video pretty quickly. The Droid Bionic has very strong multimedia features. Not only does it have the 8 megapixel camera and camcorder like we said, it also has a front-facing camera for video calls. Aside from multimedia features, the Drive Bionic also has very good business features. It has strong device and data encryption. You can also remotely wipe the device as well as the SD card. The Drive Bionic comes with an app called ZumoCast that lets you easily share and transfer files from a PC application. You can do this over 4G LTE and 3G, not just Wi-Fi. Like with the Atrix, you can dock the Droid Bionic into this laptop dock accessory and use it as a portable PC. Other accessories include an HD station, which requires an external monitor. You can also plug it in into a little tiny web top adapter that you can attach to an external monitor as well. The web top applications definitely extend the functionality of this phone. The web top app allows you to access different apps like Firefox and Facebook, as well as a variety of office apps like Citrix GoToMeeting and Citrix Documents. And of course, the Droid Bionic has all of the usual Android features like Gmail, Google Talk, and more. The Droid Bionic ships with the aforementioned 1 GHz dual core processor. It also has 1 GB of RAM and 16 GB of internal storage. It also ships with a 16 GB SD card. However, it is expandable up to 32 gigabytes. On the whole, the Drive Bionic is a slim, slick, powerful, and fast device. The web top application lets you use all of these different accessories. However, it's around $300 with a new two-year service agreement with the Verizon Wireless. The laptop dock is around $300 as well. The HD station dock, $100. The web top adapter is around $30. So is it worth the wait? We think so. But is it worth the price? We have our doubts. I'm Nicole. This has been a first look at the Editor's Choice Motorola Droid Bionic. 
No, it doesn't cost six million dollars, but if you buy into all those accessories, you are looking at a hefty chunk of change. Although, I'm sure the phone works just fine without them. Of course, you iPhone users are accustomed to spending money too, and you're gonna get a chance to do it again very soon. Ryan Tong got a sneak peek at the beta version of Apple's new iTunes Match service. Here's his look at what you can expect when it goes live later this fall. Hey guys, Brian Tong here with the CNET.com preview, and we're going to show you a first look at the iTunes Match service that was recently released to developers with new features that Apple hasn't officially announced and will be coming this fall. Now, iTunes Match is Apple's service for $24.99 a year, and you can turn on iTunes Match by going into the store menu. It matches your own personal music collection with the same tracks on iTunes and then uploads your remaining songs that can't be matched to the iCloud and allows you to listen to your entire collection anytime on your iOS devices. Plus, you'll also be able to use this service with up to 10 iOS devices and computers total, and a maximum of five of those can be computers. Now, once the iTunes Match service completes, you'll be able to either stream tracks to your computer by playing them or click on the download icon to store them locally. Once they're downloaded, the icon goes away and the size of the file changes from stream to a physical file size. Now also here, I have my iPhone running the latest developer's build and I'll go into my settings, then music, and I can turn on iTunes Match on my phone. Now jump into the music app and just like in iTunes, you'll see your tracks with the cloud icon next to each one. Now I can select a track and it will initially take some time to download it as it's streaming and it might also be intermittent because the first play basically behaves as if it's a streaming track, but once it downloads, it will remain on your phone and you can also click on the cloud icon to download all your tracks locally. Also, if you choose to download an entire album, click on download all instead. So there's your first look at the iTunes Match Beta. It's still a little inconsistent playing through songs cleanly on their first play. And I've had it jump around tracks randomly, but overall the service is pretty solid and delivers on its promise of giving you access to your entire collection on multiple devices. And we'll wait to see the final product this fall. For CNET.com, I'm Brian Tong. Once you get all your music in the right place, wouldn't it be nice if you could find it? Here's Richard Peterson with a tip for keeping iTunes organized. Have you tried listening to a complete album on your iPod only to realize that some of the tracks are missing? For some reason, they aren't grouped with the rest of the album? Hi, I'm Richard Peterson, and today I'm going to show you how to make sure all the songs on your iPod stay grouped in the albums they belong. Now this is a common problem with compilation albums like movie soundtracks or that songs of the 70s CD you bought off the infomercial, but this also happens when artists have songs on their albums that feature another artist. For example, I have Britney Spears' Femme Fatale album on my uh, friend's iPod Touch that I borrowed. When I look here at what seems to be the entire album, you'll notice the tracks 6 and 8 are missing. Where are they? Well, they were categorized under a different artist. Here's track 6, which is Britney featuring Savvy, and here's track 8, which features Will I Am. Right now we're looking at the artist view, but even if we look at the album view, the same problem exists. The iPod thinks there are three separate albums, one of them with the majority of the songs, and the other two are the two separate songs with featured artists. Another example is this movie soundtrack, which has a different artist for almost every song. It has sorted the songs into separate albums. This can be really annoying if you want to listen to the entire album from beginning to end. To fix this, we need to go into iTunes. Click up here to sort your music by album and then locate the album you want. I'll start with the soundtrack. Select all the songs in the album, right click, and then click on Get Info. Click Yes when it asks if you are sure you want to edit multiple items. Now from here, click on the Options tab and then check the box that says Part of a Compilation and then Yes. And now after we sync our iPod and sort by album, all of the songs we selected will be grouped together into one album. If you sort by artist, however, they will still be separated. This should be fine for the soundtrack album because all the songs really are by different artists. But for the Britney album, it's all essentially the same artist with just a couple songs that have a featured guest. So I'd rather just have them all categorized under Britney instead of separated as multiple artists. To fix this, select all the songs in the album and go back to the edit multiple item window like we did before. Now you'll see a field called Album Artist. You can type in the name of the artist here, but this will only help you sort your music in iTunes. It won't solve the problem we have in the iPod, because iPods, including iPhones, currently won't sort by album artist. Possibly the easiest solution is to just change the artist field so all the selected songs have the same artist. 
This of course gets rid of the featuring artist altogether. So if you want to give Will I Am credit for reaching his goal of collaborating with every recording artist in the world, you can just add his name in parentheses next to the song title. Now the next time we sync our device to iTunes, we can find all our music organized by artist and in the right albums they were meant to be. I'm Richard Peterson with CNET.com. I hate it when I try to look up a song and I can't find it because I don't know the name of the guy who did the guest vocals. I mean, come on, iTunes. You sold me the song. Why are you hiding it from me? Anyway, while we're in Apple how-to mode and spending money mode, Sharon Vaknin has one more piece of advice for you. Get ready to kiss another hundred bucks goodbye. Hey guys, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com, here to show you how Apple AirPlay lets you stream music, photos, and movies from your iOS device to your TV without any cables. To get started, you'll need a $99 Apple TV. It's the cheapest way to get AirPlay right now, but we expect Apple to integrate it with TVs in the future. Once you've set up your Apple TV and connected it to your wireless network, go to the settings menu and make sure AirPlay is turned on. When you're done, grab your iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch. Before doing anything, make sure your device is running iOS 4.2 or above, which is the minimum requirement for AirPlay. Also make sure you're connected to the same network as the Apple TV. Once you're all set up, streaming is simple. Just launch a video stored on your device or launch a YouTube video and hit play. You'll see a new AirPlay icon show up, click it, select Apple TV, and the video will be streaming on your TV seconds later. You'll notice that once the video starts playing on your TV, you won't see it on your device any longer. But you can still use it to press pause, fast forward, or rewind. Music works the same way. Launch a song or playlist and hit the AirPlay button to stream it to your home theater. Well, can't you see that it's just and for photos, head to an album, open a photo, and tap the AirPlay button. AirPlay doesn't only work with files stored on your device, it's also compatible with some apps and websites. There aren't many of them, but the list includes iMovie, Vivo, TED, NPR, and IMDb, all of which are available on any iOS device. To see the full list of apps, visit my blog on how to get started with AirPlay. If you have any questions or tips, head over to my Facebook page and visit howto.cnet.com for more videos like this. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. Now, there are any number of ways to get videos from your computer or home network to play on your TV, but AirPlay is just so easy. I cannot wait for other TV slash tablet manufacturers to figure this out. You hear that, Samsung and Sony? And how about you, Vizio? You too. In fact, I'm sure there are more, like Toshiba. But it's time to take a break. And there's a lot more tech review coming up right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET, continuing on in the good. When it comes to all-in-one desktop PCs, the iMac remains the one to beat. But a new offering from a company better known for their laptops is hoping to grab some of the spotlight. Hi, I'm Rich Brown, Senior Editor for CNET.com. Today we're going to take a look at the Toshiba DX1210. This is the first desktop we've seen from Toshiba in about 10 years. Uh, it's decided to come back in the desktop game with an all-in-one, and it actually has done a pretty good job with this system. It goes for about $935, and for that you get a 21.5-inch screen, a wireless mouse and keyboard, relatively fast performance, and a generally versatile system. Uh, it has a touch screen, although there's no big touch application uh, that sort of rounds up the touch experience. It's more like a series of apps that are pretty good. We also like that the system has an HDMI input, which means you can use it to connect external devices like a cable box. Now that really makes the system useful in a smaller space like a dorm room or a den, where you might not be able to have both a desktop and a standalone display. So you can see this Toshiba has a fairly clean design. It's a basic black here in the front. There's some silver gray accenting down at the bottom here, as well as a pedestal base. And we can show off the touch interface a little bit here. So here we have this Toshiba real-time app, which essentially takes your recent application and document history, puts it into a carousel that you can control with your finger. Now, of course, the standard Windows desktop is uh, touch-based, and it works uh, as expected. 
Here you'll see it's pretty simple. There's an SD card reader, as well as a couple of analog audio outs and USB 3 jacks, which is actually not very common on uh, all in one. So that's a nice touch. And over here on this side, you can see there's a DVD burner right here. Now, the upper portion of the side here, you can see various buttons. They control the screen brightness, volume, as well as swap the video signal if you plug in an HDMI component. Now, around the back, here's the HDMI jack. We've got a couple of the USB ports over here, as well as an Ethernet jack. And that's really about it for the inputs in the back of this system. There is one nice touch, though. Behind this little door here is another USB port that has the wireless receiver for the wireless mouse and keyboard. Now, we like that this is hidden over here, but yet it's still available if you, say, don't want to use these devices. You can take out that receiver and you get another USB port. Now, the system doesn't quite hit the sweet spot for this price range. Now, it has a relatively fast Core i5 CPU as well as 4 gigs of RAM and a 1 terabyte hard drive. That's a pretty decent hardware loadout. But the display is maybe a little bit small for this price. We've seen 23-inch monitors, for example, in all-in-ones uh, for under $1,000. There's also no Blu-ray drive, which is not unheard of in all-in-ones around this price. If we were going to improve this system, we'd probably get rid of the touch input and use that cost savings to either have a bigger monitor or maybe have a faster CPU or some other feature that's maybe more generally useful. Overall, though, Toshiba's done a pretty good job configuring the system. We recommend it to anybody that needs an all-in-one for day-to-day -day productivity as well as the convenience of an HDMI input. So I'm Rich Brown. This is the Toshiba DX1210. Welcome back, Toshiba. It's nice to see you in the desktop game again. All right now, for a look at a story ripped from the headlines, let's turn our attention to the bad. It's deja vu all over again for Apple's security squad as yet another alleged iPhone prototype has gone missing after being left in a bar. Again. Brian Tong has the story in this clip from the Apple Byte. What's happening? Brian Tong here and welcome to the Apple Byte. It's all the good stuff and bad stuff inside the world of Apple. Now I've said that 145 times and Sure feels a little like deja vu, but so will this story. Apple has lost another iPhone in a bar. Now, according to the CNET exclusive, sources say the latest iPhone prototype went missing in San Francisco in late July and may have been sold on Craigslist for $200, and Apple's attempts to find the device have been unsuccessful. Details of the device are still unclear, such as what version of iOS it was running and even what it looks like, but this time the iPhone was lost at a Mexican restaurant and bar called Cava 22, known for their tequila and shrimp lime ceviche, yummy, and sparking Apple to contact San Francisco police saying the device was priceless. So you would think, duh guys, why don't you just use Find My iPhone? Well, the Begay traced the phone to a home, which then led them to a man who had been at Cava 22 that night. San Francisco police and Apple investigators were given permission to search the home, but found nothing. Then before leaving the house, CNET sources say an Apple employee offered the man money for the phone, no questions asked, but the man continued to deny he had any knowledge of the phone. So the lesson of the day, my friends, blame it on the alcohol. And keep them away from the bars, you crazy alcoholics. Now one time is bad enough, but twice. That's a bad apple. So the Apple Bike crew decided, you know what? We're not gonna sit here and do nothing. We're gonna do whatever it takes to find the missing iPhone. an iPhone. I really want to find them. Wait, have you seen this iPhone? No, I... Missing iPhone. Have you seen, have you seen them? Have you seen this? I really need it. <laughs> Alright, come on. Man. Let's, go. let's go. Let's go. I know it's hard. It's hard. Come on, let's go. We're going to do this. We're going to find them. We'll keep trying, Tim Cook. You can count on us. And this story just keeps getting better and better, so keep an eye on our continuing coverage at CNETnews.com. And now, it's time for this week's bottom line. Now, we all know the Honda Civic isn't the most stylish, fastest, or best handling car in the world. But for just about 40 years, it's been the kind of dependable and economical car that people cannot live without. 
And the 2012 Civic Hybrid is all that and then some. When 40 MPG is something you get with a standard gas engine, the Civic Hybrid has to do a bit better. Is 44 enough? Let's drive the 2012 Honda Civic Hybrid and check the tech. The new Civic Hybrid is revised right along the lines of all the new 2012s. Spot it quickly by blue chrome accents on the outside, a couple new screen modes inside, but mostly by its bigger engine, yet higher MPG. Now inside the Civic, there are barely any cues that tell you this is a hybrid versus the gas engine car, which we just looked at a few days ago. You've got this econ button over here. In this car, of course, it changes a very different powertrain. It makes the hybrid powertrain extremely stingy, as opposed to making modest changes in the gas engine car. Right there, dead center, is your IMA logo. This is Honda's integrated motor assist. That's their technology that competes with Toyota's hybrid synergy drive. Up here on the iMid, that's a 5-inch LCD that is new on the 2012 Civic. There you find some more cues that you're in a hybrid. Aside from the usual fuel economy and distance to empty, you've also got a green gauge here and one that shows power flow on the vehicle, stuff you wouldn't have in a gas engine car. And there's your battery level also. And I think unique to the hybrid, if I'm not mistaken, is the ability to set a wallpaper for that iMid display. I didn't see that in the gas engine car. Kind of a weird differentiator, if that's the case. And what really makes sense in this car, because it's a hybrid, are those two segmented bars alongside the digital speedo. Those are the ones that coach you from blue to turquoise to green how efficiently you're driving. Handy on the gas engine car, really makes sense on this one. We know this head unit all too well. It's an optional navigation head unit if you get that trim level. It's an OK nav interface. It's not my favorite. The whole thing, though, is kind of busy and dated. But make sure you check out our 2012 standard Civic video for a full detailed look at this new cabin. One choice transmission on this guy, as with most hybrids, it's a CVT, a continuously variable transmission. It doesn't have real gears. It has just one belt pulley system that varies all the time to keep this guy in the sweet spot. Now let's go see what's plugging into it. Quite a few changes here under the hood on this new 2012 Civic Hybrid. They bumped up the gas engine from 1.3 liters to 1.5. Still has the electric motor attached to it, of course. The totals on this are 110 horsepower, all in, and 127 foot-pounds of torque. Perfectly good numbers. You're going to get to 60 in 10.1 seconds. Again, not the point on this car. The MPG is, so here's where they are. 44 city, 44 highway. Guess what? 44 average. And that's up a few MPG from the outgoing model. Honda's IMA hybrid system hard couples the electric motor to the gas engine so they always turn together. But the electric motor can power the car alone a small amount of the time. It's something you'll barely detect. And like many of the newer hybrids, the Civic turns driving into some little video game where you earn leaves as you drive greenly, and they in turn add up to some vehicle lifetime score. But I don't think you can win anything. Now, I recall the previous Civic Hybrid being kind of a coffee grinder of a thing, just kind of crude around the edges. This car does not suffer from that. Uh, it's got electric power steering, which is really nice and linear. They've done a very good job on that. And everybody who drives this car comments on the ride quality. It's got a smooth, both in terms of this, how it's sprung, as well in terms of this, how it motivates itself. There's no lumpy engagement, any more than you normally get with a hybrid, which kicks an electric motor in and out from time to time. Well, let's check the start-stop technology. That can be bulky in cars like this. I'm coming to a stop sign now. Let's see how it goes off, and more importantly, how seamlessly it comes back on. There's my stop, it goes right away. Yeah, really quick. That's one of the better restarts in the start-stop world right now. The power comes on nicely. They've dialed in the torque for everyday driving so that it's there when you need it. And handling in a car like this is, as you might imagine, it's fine. It's, you know, it's good transportation quality handling. Really, it's the ride quality I think people are gonna respond to in this vehicle, and the overall smoothness of how the power comes on and of course the MPG. I get the feeling there's a little bit less mechanical noise intrusion as well. I don't hear things whirring as much as I do in some lower cost hybrids where you hear things that sound like an elevator mechanism going up and down when you 
come to lower speeds, I'm not picking that up here. It's a better sound insulation than some. All right, a 2012 Civic Hybrid, this all new model, is gonna run you 24-8 base. Now, a couple of big options and one small one on top of that. The nav package adds $1,500. That's navigation, live traffic via FM, not XM radio, but it does add XM radio in that package and voice command for the nav. And also, you can go leather for $1,200. Your only a la carte tech is XM radio by itself for about $350. The bottom line this week? 44 miles per gallon sold. Now I know you're not going to turn a lot of heads driving a Civic as usual, but hey, you won't be spending much time at the gas pump either. All right, that's it for this time, everyone, but come back next week for an all new CNET tech review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thank you for watching.